and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah, and I am delighted to welcome K.R.R. Lockhaven back onto the podcast to talk about his upcoming novel. Hello, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Great to have you back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we will be discussing Mrs. Covington's Wait, that is the name of the book, right? I realized that I don't actually know. <laughs> yep. It's been secret Kickstarter project for so right. long. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But we'll be discussing that in a moment. But first, what's something great that happened recently, Kyle? Well, sometimes when I'm writing, I'll be writing something about like family dynamics or something. And then I'll I'll think, wait a minute, I should probably like talk like this to my kids. So <laughs> I, uh, sometimes you forget and life gets busy and stuff. But every now and then when I'm writing, I'm like, hey, that's a good idea. Um, so I kind of had little sit downs with each kid individually and kind of talked to them. And it was just kind of nice and hearing about their lives, things I may not have heard about recently. And they seem like they're doing pretty good. I love that. That is excellent. That's amazing. Such a dad one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you are such a dad. I know. Uh, I know. We've said this before, but the not just the parent figures, but also the way they talk about kids in your books is just so clearly come from a place of love and admiration. It's so delightful to read. Thank you. But we're not talking about you yet. Stop it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sarah, what's something great that happened recently? Something great that happened recently is tattoos. I got um, a new tattoo on my leg and then I extended my tattoo on my back and my back feels very weird because that happened yesterday, but I'm excited. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Nice. That's wonderful. Did did it get delayed with COVID or am I making that up? No, you're making that up. Okay. It actually <laughs> uh, got moved forward. I thought my appointment was in May, but it was actually in March. And the tattoo artist had just told me the wrong month. That's a big difference. It is a big difference. I'm glad it worked out, though. <laughs> me too. And I'm glad that I got the extra joy once I got over the panic of like, did I like misremember the date and put it down in my calendar wrong? No, she did. <laughs> oh, that's the best feeling. I didn't <laughs> yes. fuck up. They did. <laughs> once I once I got over that panic, I got to enjoy knowing that like this thing that I was looking forward to that I thought I had to wait months for was actually like, you know, super soon. That's wonderful. And you're a good thing. Mm, my good thing is that I have very strategically planned to have nachos for dinner tonight. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Listeners might not know why that is so strategic and so perfect, but trust me, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and as a beverage, stay in your chairs. I'm drinking boxed wine. <laughs> <laughs> Say it isn't so. You know, it's actually the... Look, clearly I'm a fan of boxed wine. Not all boxed wine is created equal. And this is not a good one. Is it Franzia? Yeah, but the brand is not the problem. I drink Franzia okay. all the time. <laughs> no, we got Chillable Red, which the first sip I took, I realized we had made this mistake before. <laughs> it's like grape juice. It's not, <laughs> it's oh, not no. real wine. <laughs> and I can see the appeal if it was chilled and very hot outside almost like sangria just really sweet red wine vibe but it's neither of those things so <laughs> oh well not being a wine drinker myself that kind of sounded pretty good it's good it's just not what i was expecting right. and this is <laughs> not the weather for it no like it, yeah if it was hot outside and i was drinking it with a couple ice cubes i would actually be very happy but yeah, it's certainly not Cabernet. <laughs> What's everyone else drinking tonight? I feel like thematically I should be drinking beer, but I don't actually like beer. So I'm drinking cider, which is close enough. It's close enough. <laughs> yeah, it counts. And I, I might overthink this sometimes, but I'm like such a fan of the show that I always really think, how can I pair it to match what we're talking about and stuff? So I thought, what would they drink at Miss Covington's? And so I got pub beer. It's just, that's all it says. It's like white <laughs> can, it's pub beer, and black on it. It's from Ten Barrel Brewing out of Portland. Would and you hold that up for a second again? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. That's a screenshot for the Discord, <laughs> okay. not for Twitter. 
That does sound very perfectly themed. Yeah. I did consider drinking beer for tonight, but then didn't go to the store. (laughs) (laughs) I bet when it's hot, Mrs. So, okay, actually, question. Do you pronounce it Covington or Covington? Uh, I guess in my head, I always say Covington. Okay. Okay, well, I just want to make sure because I've been pronouncing it Covington. Oh, that's fine. But I wanted to make sure that I am actually pronouncing it correctly. But I was going to say that I bet that during the hot summer months, they would sell some form of, you know, chilled red wine, sweet red wine at Mrs. Covington's. Yeah. Yeah. They got to expand their drink menu for sure. They're, this kind of got started with the food. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe next. there's a saguapa recipe that Cora can introduce them to. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. This is actually a book podcast. So has anyone read anything good lately other than the delightful text we're about to discuss? I started reading Exit Ghost by Jennifer Donahue. It's her debut novel. Um, We've read the first of her kind of cyberpunk-esque novellas, but Exit Ghost is completely unlike those. But I needed something to read on the plane because I had to travel to get my tattoo. And this was perfect. I'm really enjoying it. I'm only like 25% of the way through, but it's great. It's witchy Hamlet. Witchy girl Hamlet. <laughs> Hamlet's already pretty witchy, so this is that's true. exciting. <laughs> and the main character, Jules, makes so many bad decisions, and she has a very cute Doberman. <clears throat> Ooh, that sounds wonderful. I, uh, a week or two ago, mentioned being very disappointed by a fan fiction author because <laughs> they wrote a series that I loved. And then I read some more of their work and it was terrible. But I started combing through their bookmarks and I found a new Witcher fan fiction author. Oh, good. (laughs) So I've been working through that now. (laughs) That's uh, the story of my life. Thank you for listening. (laughs) I've been reading two things right now. I'm listening to the audiobook of Miss Percy's Travel Guide to Welsh Moors and Feral Dragons. That's been great. You know, just like the first one. And then I've been reading Orphan Planet by Rex Burke. And it's really good, too. It's kind of like a... I'm not that far into it yet, but it kind of has like cozy sci-fi vibes. And and it's it's funny, too. I've been really liking the humor. Yeah, I've both of those I've heard really good things about. Obviously, I love the first Miss Percy. I haven't read the second one yet, but I'm sure it's excellent. And um, I know that Sue Baby is a big fan of Rex Burke and this book. So she recommended it and she's got a good taste in books. So I want to check it out. Yeah. And the audio of that Miss Percy, I was kind of wondering how the audio would go with the, all the parentheses and stuff, but Mm -hmm. it's really good. She does it really well. Nice. Well, we're actually here to talk about Mrs. Covington's, (laughs) a book about a pub, There may or may not involve beer and nachos. You'll find out if you listen to the rest of the episode. But the first question we have for you is that you decided to launch this book as part of a Kickstarter instead of with the publisher that you have an established trilogy with. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the first thing I did was I asked them if that kind of thing was okay, And they were like, oh, yeah, go for it. You know, (laughs) that was cool. And uh, I just, I'm on the schedule for my trilogy, and I just had this kind of need to get this story out. I don't, it just kind of hit me, and I really wanted to do it, and I really wanted to kind of do it now. And then I've also been kicking around the idea um, of a Kickstarter. Sorry about that. (laughs) But uh, We famously uh, hate puns, it's true. (laughs) You should never apologize for bad puns. (laughs) Never. All right. Sean Gibson would be proud. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been thinking about that anyway. So I was like, well, you know, try it. And it's, you know, pretty daunting. I, I'm worried that it it's not going to get funded, but it's also pretty fun to set up and been having a pretty good time with it. Well, it was an absolute blast to read. So I feel like you have the most important part down. I say yes. that obviously a Kickstarter is so much more than just the actual work. <laughs> Turns out marketing is a whole thing. Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> I have been dabbling in Lego stop motion things. And so I made a 
a bigger Lego stop motion uh, trailer for this. That's going to be the video on the Kickstarter and pretty, I mean, I'm, we're pretty proud of it. It's pretty funny. That's awesome. All of your book trailers have been fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this. Speaking of the art on your Kickstarter, how did you uh, pick an artist <laughs> for the cover, et cetera? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know this podcaster and her husband is a really good artist, and I got to hang out with both of them when uh, they came down to my book signing. And so they're also both really cute and smart. I'm just going to oh, say that now. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think I think that might be going a step too far. <laughs> no, I'll fight no. you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah. yeah so uh, the cover artist is Lily's husband, Daniel. And he is fantastic. I was so happy with what what he did. And then after he did the cover, I asked him if he could do a postcard as part of a, a reward for the uh, Kickstarter. And he did that. And that's awesome, too. So I think I have a new uh, favorite artist. <laughs> He's certainly my favorite artist. I'm a yeah. little biased. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cover that he made. And by the time this episode comes out, your cover will be will will have debuted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people can go and look at it after after listening to this episode. But the cover is really fantastic. He Danny did such a great job. Yeah. Very selfishly, I have just loved being able to see all of the back and forth, back end secret stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I got an inside look into the contents of this book a little bit before I actually got to read it. And that was really fun. Nice. I can't believe that you didn't like immediately tell me that Danny was doing the art. I am so not on Twitter. I assume everyone knows everything that I know. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I'll be a better secret agent next time. <laughs> and it's also interesting, like with doing a Kickstarter, trying to walk the line between, you know, promoting it and talking about it, but also keeping enough back so that there's still mystery. So people want to join the Kickstarter. I don't even know how you do that. So good job. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's been a learning process for sure. I, I don't know if I need to wait until it's actually launched to really start talking about it. And that's kind of the, the way I'm going. But yeah, it, it'll be exciting to get going. It's only a few more days. How long has um, this process been going on? Like how long have you have you spent setting up the Kickstarter and getting ready for this launch? Well, I would say probably the last two months is as long as I've been doing the Kickstarter thing. Um, the book was already mostly written by then because I wasn't really sure about that even. Like, does the book need to be done before I launch? And it doesn't need to be. So, yeah, about two months. And it keeps changing, like the rewards and stuff like that. I'll have an idea and add one and then I'll take one away. And I'm still not 100% yet on that. Well, you don't have to be 100% until the day it actually launches. So Yeah, exactly. Can you share a reward that you've taken away <laughs> that you've decided you won't do? Well, uh, yeah, I think I was going to have be a character in the book and I'm not. That really sounds sure hard. That. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that sounds a, a lot easier if the book isn't already fully written, <laughs> which your book is fully written. Yeah, I thought maybe I could just make them a patron or something and come in, have a little <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> I don't know. Were you planning on doing this as a Kickstarter, like from the whole process of writing the book? No, I just I, I felt like something like that would be fairly easy to add in afterwards. But I got rid of it because mostly because I didn't know if it would be appealing to anyone. <laughs> yeah. Next time, what you do is you write in bar patron who shows up to the bar a couple of times and then just have the name really easily replaceable <laughs> and only that let one been... person do it there you go problem solved <laughs> yeah that would have been the smart one <laughs> for the record i totally would have pledged at that level to be a patron at mrs covington's <laughs> well i can still add it back <laughs> <laughs> so this book takes place in a world that you have already visited before I call it the Azure series, and I know that's not actually the name of it. The Archipelago? Yeah. Mm, yes. But the, the trilogy that you're writing with, I just keep coming back to Azure because I love her as a character so much. That's not relevant to this conversation. Everyone go listen to those episodes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the point is, 
uh, this is now a standalone that you're writing in a world that's already established. And what was that like, especially considering there were some tie-ins that we saw as far as like connections between this and the other series? Eleanor. Eleanor. I have a note from when I was reading this book that just says, Eleanor Covington, exclamation point, exclamation point, <laughs> exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was it was pretty fun to write in that same world and kind of get to expand on it a little more, but not necessarily have any ties to it. I know there are ties for people like you who might notice that, but <laughs> definitely not necessary to know any of that. And I wanted that to be like a big part of it. it it's a standalone thing. But yeah, just for the few people who have read the uh, series, there's little Easter egg type things in there. There's another Easter egg that's not related to the trilogy at all, but you have a dripping bucket in there, which is kind of, I call it a, a Twitter shared universe. But can you talk a little bit about your decision to include a dripping bucket? What is the dripping bucket? Help me, I'm out of the loop. It's a, uh, I, I think Michael Fletcher created it. And it's just a pub that gets to be in lots of different books. Like he put it out there, like there should be a dripping bucket in in every fantasy story or something like that. So lots of people now, I don't know how many, but quite a few have a dripping bucket in their book somewhere. So I really just wanted to be a part of that. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I think it ended up working pretty good. It's I think it's supposed to be known for being a pretty rough place. So I hope I did it some justice. I really enjoyed it, saying it. So, <laughs> Well, it especially works because your novels tend to have a sort of multiverse background to them, even when that's not like the main focus of the story. So I think it fits in perfectly. Nice. All right. We tried to do some like last second frantic research and didn't come up with an answer. But Cyrus who is the captain who sets the main character off sort not necessarily on this journey but inspires him for the events of this book he must know the marauder king right <laughs> is he the marauder king someone the name cyrus like sparked something in my head i don't know there's definitely some connection there and maybe this is just me like starting some fan fiction for this series but that was kind of where i started going <laughs> well uh, the uh, so the Marauder King is actually <gasps> <laughs> he has a long way to go, but <laughs> hold on, I need a minute. <laughs> and yeah, I'm still yeah. reeling. Hold yeah. on, yeah, <laughs> I'm I need a minute to process that. That is fantastic. <laughs> I love it so, so, so much. Oh my god, <laughs> is that. Something that you decided as you were writing Mrs. Covington's, or is this like a background that you had in mind for that character, you know, all the way? So it's going to take a little bit of retcon in book three, I think, because I he kind of gives his story in book one that <laughs> doesn't involve all this stuff. <laughs> Okay, so you described this book as cozy fantasy, and you've kind of said already that like that was your goal, that you wanted to write a cozy fantasy novel. So that's not, it sounds like that's not something that you discovered through the process of writing. Like you, you set out you to specifically do something that was cozy. Yeah, yes, for sure. I mean, my writing has kind of been drifting towards cozier and cozier so it's got some cozy aspects to it <laughs> yeah so i thought i'd just go full on do just a, a cozy book yeah it was it was always supposed to be that way and i found that i really enjoy it is that like the main reason was there anything else that drew you to cozy fantasy or was it just that you your writing kind of naturally gravitates that way anyway yeah, well, I mean, I was inspired, you could say, by Legends and Lattes, you know, of course. And so I, I loved that. And it kind of, I don't know, made me think about, well, what in my world could be. I was going to, what's the weird marketing word for if you liked this book, you like this book? Not a dupe. That's a makeup word. What am I thinking? Oh, a, a book comp? Comp. Comp, yeah. I would say Legends and Lattes is a comp for Mrs. Covington's for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Legends and Lattes. The other one that comes to mind is Can't Spell Treason Without Tea by, I believe, the author is Rebecca Thorne, which is similarly cozy fantasy involving a business of some kind. A cozy business. A food business, specifically. <laughs> yes. Food business, specifically. I need to read that one. I haven't yet. It's good. I really enjoyed it. The sequel came out last month, I believe, but I haven't had a chance to actually pick that up yet. I my brain process has been completely halted. I'm sorry. Like I, I know, can't. I'm sorry about the from that revelation. <laughs> no, you should oh. not apologize. It was a fantastic <laughs> okay. revelation. No, I just uh, <laughs> like really I can't. Like I know we have questions written, but I cannot go to them because I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of our one of our questions, kind of along the lines of the Marauder King, in a sense, is that you write a lot about sailing. You know, they're pirates, people are on boats a lot, both in your trilogy and in this book. Do you have sailing experience or was that something that you had to research? I have uh, absolutely zero sailing experience. <laughs> I would like to remedy that someday, but right now I, I don't have any, but I just love it. I I don't know why I'm drawn to it. Yeah, so it's been research and I'm sure that I'm getting a lot of it wrong. So I always try to to make it like through the eyes of the character. Like I only need to know as much as the character knows. And so that kind of lets me, I think, get around the more technical terms and stuff like that. And also it's fantasy. I mean, I maybe there are some fantasy readers who know lots about sailing because they're readers who know lots about everything. But I think most people are probably willing to to give you a hand wave if you get something a little off. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, that's exactly the type of thing that I would say. But then if something got something a little off for one of my passion hobbies, I would rip <laughs> them a new one. So, <laughs> yeah, who cares about sailing? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I like I like saying like you know the character says something to another character and then that character passes it on to in a more technical terms <laughs> I just, oh, I there you go. <laughs> <laughs> just hand wave it away it's fine yeah someone knows what they're talking about but it's not right. me <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so we have not really talked about the actual events of this book very much but it starts with our main character jacob buying mrs covington's a pub on this island that I would like to move to, please. I don't know. I I really I really like the island, but there is a horrible landowner who's a big old douchebag. That's true. And I wouldn't want to deal with him because he sounds like an asshole. I will yeah. evict him. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We're not getting oh. that. It's ugh, okay. I'll we'll figure it out. But one of Jacob's very first things he does as owner of the pub is spit in his capitalist father's face by turning it into a (laughs) co-op. And that was just so delightful. I loved that so much. And it absolutely made the tone of the whole book so collaborative between him and Cora and Tadric, whose name I hope I'm saying correctly. Yes. Okay. (laughs) That's what I was going for, for sure. The kind of the whole tone of the, yeah, the whole tone of the whole book is about that, more or less. It definitely worked. So another very prominent theme of this book is the concept of racism. However, it's explored through these fantasy races, like Fawns and Siguapa. How did using fantasy races make it easier to explore this concept? And this isn't something that you only do in this book like this is a a topic or a theme that you explore in the other two books that you have published that set in the same setting as well yeah oh gosh <laughs> i'm trying to like make sure to answer <laughs> tactfully and <laughs> oh you don't know how much bullshit i cut out of me try- <laughs> like i'll start talking about a sensitive subject and then i'm like oh no all that was stupid and rude let me redo that <laughs> let's see yeah it's like i feel like i don't know how to necessarily speak for any other races but when it's a fantasy race it seems easier but i don't know how to put that in eloquent terms well i I think that's exactly it right there's a level of dissociation when it is a fantasy race versus racism that real people have to deal with every day 
and there that separation creates a, a gap that makes it much less personal. So even when you're talking about struggles that real people experience, because it's a story being told about this fantastical creature, it's a little bit less immediate. Yeah. I almost feel like that is, <laughs> it could be taken the wrong way, you know, maybe like calling this thing a creature <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I'm torn on that one. Well, I said it. So I'm the one who sounds like an asshole if I'm wrong. <laughs> do you just want to give every fawn a big hug? Because I do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. yeah. I, I love them. <laughs> they need more hugs. I, I get that the world you've created means that they don't just get a bunch of hugs and uh, compassion, but that just means like my instinct is to make up for that every time they come up on the page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Juniper ends up getting some hugs, some well-deserved hugs, but uh, I agree. I mean, I really loved writing uh, Juniper as the fawn character in the book who... Her restaurant is going under, which kind of sparks the whole thing with the treasure hunt, which is more or less kind of the the biggest thing in the book. They're trying to make this pub work, and they're trying to get this treasure to save this fawn woman's restaurant, and they all kind of just bond throughout, and and now I lost the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I also loved about her were the glimpses we get. I mean, she's a single mother, but we also get to see her being a person and just having that fullness of character richness of character was really nice i think in a lot of stories motherhood gets reduced to the single aspect that you learn about someone and so having her be this like full person beyond that was extremely fulfilling i i think that we when we often when we get single mother plot lines you don't really see like you see a financial struggle, you you see a struggle to care for the children, but you don't see any kind of struggle about having like you time mm -hmm. and having to kind of drop everything to just focus on providing for your children, which we do in Juniper's plot line. Like we see her kind of struggle with not having enough time to herself because she has to care for her kids, which is really, really relatable. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a thing. And I wanted her to, yeah, just, I, I felt it made her a fuller character and more realistic to have that kind of thing going. And she's, she's kind of upset at herself for even suggesting that she should get time to herself. And I, I've had that feeling before too. Like I almost feel guilty for any free time that I take. And so I wanted to try to capture that in a way. But it's such a a warm, hmm, what am I trying to say? Like you said, this struggle with, you know, wanting to be a, a parent with every fiber of your being, but then also wanting to be a person and then feeling bad about wanting to be a person. Or she's clearly struggling with that. And it just makes you so sympathetic to her overall. It was just delightful. And heartbreaking and delightful. <laughs> you you don't feel like she's resentful of her children or or a bad person or anything for wanting this. You yeah. you really empathize with her and like feel for her. Well, that's that's good. <laughs> I'm I'm glad it came across that way. That's what I was going Perfect. For. <laughs> Two thumbs way up. So this is us having a little bit of insight into your thought process with this book. But I was wondering if you would tell our listeners a little bit about your choice between using nasias versus nachos as the phrase for the food item that saves these restaurants, this restaurant and this pub from bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, initially I had just wrote them in as nachos and made a story up for why they were called nachos in this world. And the person who I had edit this book this time is Nathan Hall. And he is fantastic. Like, I just, 
absolutely loved our interaction and he was he was not afraid at all to be pretty tough with me and to, and to <laughs> tell me when things were wrong and he just said i am not buying that the words for nachos just happen to be these things <laughs> <laughs> so so i changed it and i think i think it ended up being pretty good cuz i ended up making it an emotional thing with juniper and her husband so I was pretty happy with it, but I did ask you guys if what you thought, and you said either way would be would be fine. So I think I'm staying with uh, Nasia's. <laughs> I love it. I would have been fine either way, but I'm the kind of reader specific, like specifically me is the kind of reader who finds that kind of discrepancy fun. <laughs> if you were just like, oh yeah, Tupperware in your high fantasy novel, I'd be like, that's hilarious. I'm into it. <laughs> okay, but I do want someone to write a high fantasy novel with Tupperware, specifically with that <laughs> word now. Right, it's just like such a specific <laughs> brand name that you're like, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I said... She said something like, the word for chips is na, and the word for cheese is cho. And he's like, he put on his little notes, like, eye roll. He's like, no way. I mean, I would have been okay with that too. But I I do love the way that you tied it to Juniper and her husband and kind of like that emotional beat. So that worked quite well. It did end up working out. So how different is this first draft from the original version then? Final draft. Is yeah, it, final. Is, first is, is final. What, <laughs> is, did I say the complete wrong word? Is what we read the final version or are you still making changes? I think um makes very small changes. I mentioned on Twitter the other day that I happened to search uh, shook in the text and somebody was shaking their head like every five pages. <laughs> <laughs> Little things like that I need to correct. But other than that, it's it's what you guys read is what it is. Yeah, like I was saying, Nathan Hall was just really great with the changes. Like it was it was not easy. Like he had a lot of difficult changes and he was right every time. And so I really am happy with the product that I you know gave to you guys. Before that, it was I mean, it was the same story, but he really encouraged me to add more emotion and and different things like that that I think really improved it. I will say that I think this is my favorite book of yours that I've read thus far. It was fantastic and I absolutely loved it. I also want to take a minute to plug Nathan Hall, who is an author himself, in addition to being an editor. I say plug. I haven't actually read his book. I own it on Kindle. <laughs> so it's on my TBR. <laughs> but he he is an author in addition to being from what you are saying, quite, quite a good editor. Yeah, I'm sure whatever he's written is really good. I need to, I haven't read any of his stuff yet either, but it's on my TBR as well. If you haven't read his work, how did you pick him to be an editor? Like what made you think he'd be good? So he did this thing on Twitter one day where he said, send me the first page of your work in progress and I'll edit it. I have some extra time or something like that. So I did it and I was pretty blown away by what he did with one page like it was more criticizing than I expected and he was absolutely right with everything and so even though I wasn't super familiar with him that was enough for me and so I went with them and I'm happy I did that's awesome well obviously I can't speak to the original draft but this final version is quite good so thank you I'll <laughs> pass that on to you has a lot to do with him. I mean, I think you deserve some credit for that too. Maybe a, a little, little bit. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. So what would you like readers to take away from this book? I would like them to take away just a smile and a, a bit of a just good, feeling good, really. I mean, not a lot more than that. That was the kind of the goal is just to, I kind of made myself feel good when writing it. <laughs> I, I hope that that's what people come away with. You know, there's... There's a lot of different little themes and, and stuff like that, but that's the overall thing is just hope I make them smile. I mean, I think it really is like one of the best cozy fantasy books that I've read. And it does like make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. Not that the characters don't go through hardship because they do and they deal with assholes, but it's just the way that everything plays out is so like 
you're happy for them. It's uplifting. There's nothing too bad that happens. Right. Two out of two, you have a 100% success rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I'm happy to hear it. So can you tell us a little bit about the Kickstarter? What can listeners expect when they venture onto that page? What What's waiting for them over there? Also, can you tell us when the Kickstarter is launching? If this episode comes out on next Wednesday, the 15th, is the Kickstarter up already? Yes, it will have come out yesterday. So March 14th is the day, and then it's running for 30 days. So I think that's April 13th. So the tiers have been have been interesting to create. <laughs> I mean, it starts with, they give you all these little ideas about what you can do. And so one of them is just like a dollar for nothing. Just because you feel like supporting something. <laughs> and then there's an ebook, there's a paperback, there's a hardcover, and there's also the the postcard that Daniel created. And then there's little things like, I guess I can go ahead and just say it, but <laughs> <laughs> you could name a capybara in the book. Oh, wait, we were talking about that, right? I don't think we did. I don't think I knew that. We haven't talked about naming a capybara in the book. Okay. We've talked about naming, getting a character named after right. yourself, which is uh, no longer None of the option. listeners are going to be able to do that because Sarah and I are going to take all of those <laughs> <laughs> before anyone gets to them. <laughs> yeah, there'll be several opportunities for that. And and the first person who does it can even give Miss Covington her first name. So <laughs> I was wondering about that. I actually really loved that our power couple in this novel is Mrs. Covington and Arthur. And there's something very powerful in that she is Mrs. Covington, but he just has a first name. And it sounds like there's maybe just some Kickstarter background behind that, but I'm going to assume it's like a deep commentary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep commentary. <laughs> But uh, yeah, and then there will be other capybaras in the book that are nameable. So I don't know. I don't know if anyone's going to do that, but I thought it was a fun thing to add. I can tell you right now that yes, someone will do it. <laughs> and that who someone knows who? might be me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and really, I'm coming down to the wire in a way on what I'm actually going to have. I was kind of wondering if you guys had any ideas that I might be able to have as a reward. Stickers. I love stickers. <laughs> okay. I don't know about a Kickstarter reward, but I have actually planned your book launch. So uh, what we do is we rent out a bar and we get them to let us put a sign, Mrs. Covington's, Covington's, in the bar and then serve beer and nachos there. It's going to be perfect. And if we're expecting like a smaller turnout, then maybe we just do like a private event, but they'll still let us put a sign up. That'll be fine. It's going to be fantastic. That's it's already decided. You don't have a choice. <laughs> I'm in. I yeah. like it. I've planned the whole thing. <laughs> I guess the only question is, are we doing it in my town or am I going up to where you're at in Seattle to do it? I would go to Eastern Washington. I do think that maybe it would be easier to do it for guests in seattle because seattle's more central but i would travel to eastern washington for that too anyway we get off topic so if someone wants to back you on kickstarter or follow the story of mrs covington's and the wider world where can they find you on the internet we will also link to the kickstarter in our show notes okay so listeners can go to that if they want to get the link as well Okay, perfect. I have a website, krrlockhaven.com. And then on Twitter, I'm at Kyle's137. I have a Facebook too, KRR Lockhaven, I think. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been an absolute pleasure as always. And I'm going to go eat some nachos. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for having me. It's always fun. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We are on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and follow us wherever your podcasts live. 
Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.